Last time on our show, we dedicated our entire episode to the star in our backyard, the one that makes life on Earth possible, the sun. Today, we're going to expand on that discussion and talk about the wide world of stars, ranging from those much like our sun to other very strange and exotic objects. If you're enjoying the discussions we have on our show, then there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show that you should check out. It's called the Chicago Booth Review Podcast. What's the best way to deliver negative feedback? How can you use AI to improve your business strategy? And why is achieving a soft landing so hard? The Chicago Booth Review Podcast addresses the big questions in business, policy, and markets with insights from the world's leading academic researchers. It's groundbreaking research in a clear and straightforward way. Find the Chicago Booth Review Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. I'm Shalma Wegsman. And I'm Dan Hooper. To understand the wide range of stars in our universe, we need to understand where they came from and how they came to be. So let's start there. Pretty much all stars form when giant clouds of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, collapse under the attractive force of gravity. This gas is usually in the form of what we call a giant molecular cloud. These clouds are something like 100 light years across, so a really vast cloud of gas and it can contain millions of times as much mass as the sun. Um, so just gargantuan clouds of hydrogen and helium spanning huge volumes of space. But gravity works hard on these clouds, and as they collapse, uh, it turns out they start to break into smaller and smaller pieces. And these fragments eventually collapse into things that we'd recognize as individual stars. Okay, so we're kind of starting our story with our giant clouds of gas, right? But where do those clouds of gas come from? So in the first few minutes after the Big Bang, most of the nuclei of the lightest elements, namely hydrogen, deuterium, helium, lithium, all that was formed very early on. So basically in that time, the universe was a big fusion reactor, made a bunch of helium out of the free protons. And a few minutes into the universe's history, that was all over. So our universe kind of started in that sense with a lot of these raw materials to build stars with. So let's focus in on one of these fragments of gas that kind of broke apart when this giant molecular cloud was collapsing. The gravity takes that fragment and it squeezes it into a smaller and smaller volume, and it causes that gas, that hydrogen and helium, to steadily heat up. We call this kind of object a protostar. So as the name implies, it's not a star yet, but like this is the stage leading up to the birth of a real star. If that protostar gets hot enough, nuclear fusion will start to take place in its center or in its core. That fusion releases energy and creates pressure that starts to push outward against the force of gravity. So this is going to be a theme all over this show. We've got gravity squeezing the star, in this case, the protostar, together, and fusion going on, creating energy and pressure that pushes back against that gravity, trying to resist compression. So the, the gravity just keeps working, makes the protostar smaller, creates more heat in the core, creating more and more fusion, and eventually these two forces enter into a state of equilibrium, what we call hydrostatic equilibrium where if it got a little bit bigger, gravity would be more efficient. It would crush it down for smaller. And if it got a little smaller, fusion would kick in uh, more strongly, making it bigger. So you kind of reach a steady state where the star isn't going to get any smaller or any bigger, at least until something changes about its chemistry. And that's when you go from being a protostar to being a legitimate, real, actual star. Okay, so protos are protostars also fusing or just like not as much and not enough to counter gravity? Is that the idea? Like one only once it settles into like its sort of 
equilibrium size of, you know, gravity pulling it in, fusion pushing it out, that's when it's a star. So I'm not sure, like, where the exact definition that, you know, you draw between a protostar and a star is. And maybe maybe that's even not a thing. Maybe it's a kind of a vague transition. I'm not sure. But generally speaking, most of the energy being released by a protostar is gravitational potential energy. So this thing is getting squeezed down and all that gravitational potential energy is being converted into heat and light and stuff like this. But then, you know, as it as it gets small enough, that fusion kicks in. And there certainly can be some fusion going on in the middle of a protostar. Um, and eventually, as that gravitational potential energy goes away and all you're really left as a source of energy is that fusion, that's when you start to see this equilibrium between gravity and fusion start to balance against each other. And we start to see something like that looks like a round sphere of gas that, you know, looks like a star. So the characteristics of a given star, you know, and not just at a moment, but how that star is going to evolve over time are determined by a bunch of different factors. But the most important factor is just how massive that star is, how, how, how much hydrogen and helium it consists of. The least massive stars tend to be pretty cold and they tend to evolve only very slowly with time. And the more massive stars tend to be hotter and they tend to change a lot more quickly. So I think what makes sense on this podcast is we'll start on the smallest stars and we'll work our way up. So uh, we're going to start with kind of dull, mundane sort of objects. And I mean, you know, astrophysically speaking. And by the end, we're going to get to some pretty wild, dramatic, and extreme forms of stellar objects. At the smallest end of the, you know, range of, of stellar objects are these things we call brown dwarfs. So brown dwarfs are, you know, balls of gas that are, are too big to be considered planets, but they're like barely stars. You can think of it as, as like if Jupiter were, you know, just a lot bigger, but kind of like Jupiter, you would start to find an object that looked a lot like a brown dwarf. So in terms of their mass, brown dwarfs have between a, a mass of about 1.25% of that of the sun and as big as about 8% of the sun. So it is a, in other words, its mass is between 1% and 8% of a solar mass. We often use our sun for comparison when talking about other stars, so you might hear us use units such as solar mass or solar radius. So the solar mass is just the mass of our sun, that's about 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, or about 330 times the mass of Earth. And solar radius is the radius of our sun, about 700,000 kilometers, or 109 times larger than the Earth's radius. So just keep that in mind as you listen. So the thing that makes a brown dwarf different from just a big planet is that there's a little bit of nuclear fusion that can be going on in its core. So most stars, bigger stars, like stars like the sun and pretty much all kinds of stars um, other than brown dwarfs, can fuse hydrogen nuclei or what we call protons together to form helium and other elements. That doesn't go on in a brown dwarf. Their cores aren't hot enough for uh, you know uh, ordinary hydrogen uh, fusion to go on. We can't burn hydrogen in a, in, in a brown dwarf. But there's another element that exists in small quantities, but non-negligible quantities in our universe called deuterium. And a deuterium is just a heavy version of hydrogen. It's a bound state of a proton and a neutron. And this can be burned in the core of a brown dwarf, producing energy through that process of fusion. So this doesn't make a brown dwarf nearly as hot as a larger star, but it does heat the star. Um, and, you know, these things will typically have surface temperatures in the range of, you know, several hundred degrees Kelvin up to a couple of thousand degrees Kelvin. So this is pretty cold by uh, stellar standards, but it's a lot hotter than most planets. So um, that, that fusion does have the effect of, of heating the brown dwarf quite a bit. One thing I'll mention before going on is that the, the name of these stars is a bit of a misnomer. The uh, brown dwarfs aren't necessarily brown. They have a bunch of different colors depending on their temperatures. Um, some of the warmest ones have like colors in the kind of the orange or red range. 
And then the coolest ones are kind of magenta or even kind of a black color. So, you know, th these are, are kind of very, very faint objects, kind of like a planet, but without a nearby star to illuminate it. And because they're so faint, we haven't seen very many of them. We've only observed a handful of brown dwarfs directly to date. They're awfully hard to detect with a, you know, our existing telescopes. All right, so moving up in terms of more massive stars, stars with more than about 8% of a solar mass, um, in these stars, hydrogen fusion is able to kick in in their cores. And because there's a lot more hydrogen than there is deuterium, this can release a lot more energy than, uh, than, than is released in the core of a brown dwarf. Um, this kicks in when the core of a star heats up to about 10 million degrees. Um, and once this kicks in and reaches a state of equilibrium between the pressure from fusion and the contraction from gravity, we say that a star has entered what we call the main sequence. So once you're along the main sequence, you're in the state of hydrostatic equilibrium, and you just kind of evolve using the fusion of hydrogen forming uh, helium to balance against the force of gravity. Let's pause now to talk a little more about what exactly is happening in this process of fusion that is producing all this outward pressure and energy. In a star like the sun or, or stars smaller than the sun as well, the main way this works is through something called the proton-proton chain. So in the proton-proton chain, you take a pair of protons, they get bound together to form deuterium, and then you combine that with another proton to make a helium-3 nucleus, which then pairs of those go on to combine to make helium-4. And when you're all done, basically this process takes four protons and converts it into a helium nucleus. And in the process of that, they release a fair amount of energy. It's, it's not a ton of energy on, in, in an event-by-event -event basis, but this is going on at a staggeringly high rate in the core of these stars. And that's where so, you know, ordinary main sequence stars get pretty much all of their energy. So all the sunlight you see and all the starlight you see, pretty much all that is coming from the fusion of hydrogen into helium. In larger stars, stars larger than the sun, um, the proton-proton chain gets eclipsed by a different process called the CNO cycle. So just like the proton-proton chain, the CNO cycle takes protons and makes them into helium, but by including the elements, the nuclear elements of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in the stellar environment, it turns out there's a way to do this much more efficiently and more quickly and release more energy. So in big stars, big main sequence stars, the CNO cycle is the main way that you make helium. In um, stars smaller than the sun, just the proton-proton chain is the main way that this goes on. So the process of fusion, along with the compression provided by gravity, heats up a star, and it heats it up a lot. Like I've already said a couple of times in this podcast that stars are big balls of gas, but that's not precisely true. In fact, stars are so hot that they're not gas, they're plasma. So what I mean by that is in a gas, you have a bunch of electrically neutral atoms, okay? So if you had electrically neutral hydrogen and helium, then you'd say you have a gas of hydrogen and helium. But in the sun or in stars, you don't generally have this. Instead, you have individual nuclei, protons and helium nuclei, and you have individual electrons, and all these objects are electrically charged. So whereas a gas is made of electrically neutral objects, a plasma is made of you know, electrically charged objects. Right, and that's because they're in like such a heated environment that like an atom isn't going to be able to hold on to its electrons, for example. Right. Like, everything's kind of more soupy and moving around. And once you separate these elements, the electron from the uh, nucleus, then you have these charged elements. And it turns out the temperature where electrons start to break apart from their atoms is like a few thousand degrees, which in the core of any any star we're talking about, there's plenty of, plenty of heat to uh, to tear those electrons off. So you basically just find the charged particles. You don't find any of them, any of them meaningfully bound together. So in most stars, the plasma that they contain is made up of the same kinds of nuclear elements that we find throughout the universe at large. So it, in large scales, average, most of the, about 74% of the mass in the universe in, in, in ordinary matter is in the form of protons. 24% uh, is helium, about 1% is oxygen, 
and then half a percent of carbon, and then something like 0.1% of things like neon, iron, nitrogen, and smaller amounts of silicon, so on and so on. So you get kind of get that same sort of uh, collection of elements in most stars. The stars that are the oldest tend to have the least heavy elements in them. So they tend to be almost purely hydrogen and helium. But stars that form more recently after other stars that came before them had produced things like iron and silicon and et cetera, they tend to have larger trace abundances of these heavier elements. All right, so talking about these main sequence stars a little bit more, the smallest of the main sequence stars are, are stars we call red dwarfs. So red dwarfs have masses in the range, you know, just above that of a brown dwarf, so 8% of a solar mass, and they can go up to maybe 60% or 70 or 80% of the mass of the sun. So these are stars that are smaller than the sun, but, you know, still kind of sun-like in a lot of respects. They're also physically smaller than the sun. They have radii between 10% and 60% of the radius of the sun. And they tend to be a little colder than, or they are, their surfaces are a little colder than the sun with surface temperatures in the range of about 2000 to 4000 degrees. And it's that slightly colder temperature that gives them their red color. If you would heat it up their surface temperature, they would go from red to yellow, um, starting to look more and more like the sun. Um, but red dwarfs, you know, with their cooler surface temperatures, earn their name of, re- of a red dwarf. So as a side note, it might be curious that out of all the colors of light in the electromagnetic spectrum that extend far outside the range of the visible, these main sequence stars really do peak in the visible range. So rather than this being a coincidence, you could think that this is by design. Here's how I think about it. The reason why our eyes are good at seeing light in the optical spectrum is because we happen to be next to a star, the sun, that produces most of its light in that range. And, you know, the most useful kind of eyes you can have when you live on a planet near the sun is one that can see the kind of light that the sun reflects off objects. So through natural selection, our eyes got to be really good at seeing optical photons. If you lived on a planet near a red dwarf over, you know, billions of years, your eyes would very likely evolve to something that was really good at seeing red or maybe even infrared light. You know, so I I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the sun produces light that we're good at seeing. Um, But yeah, because red dwarfs are a little colder, um, they produce light that's a little redder. Because red dwarfs are smaller and cooler than stars like the sun, they're a lot fainter than the sun. So a typical red dwarf might be about 7% as bright as the sun if you were at the same distance. And this makes it hard for astronomers to observe and study them. Um, as it turns out, most of the stars out there in the Milky Way or in the universe at large are red dwarfs. But you wouldn't know this by looking at the night sky, right? You don't see many red stars if you you know just stare up at the sky. And this is just because they're so faint. But in fact, probably about 75% of all stars in the Milky Way are red dwarfs, but there are very few of them that we can see and study. A couple of um, like notable examples of red dwarfs that astronomers study, um, and by notable, I really just mean nearby, is the star Proxima Centauri. So this is um, basically the nearest star to the Earth, other than the sun, that is. It's only 4.2 light years away. Um, It's part of the Alpha Centauri system. So there are three stars in that system all bound together, and one of them is a red dwarf. The other one is Barnard's star. Um, It's a small red dwarf, and it's just under six light years away from us, making it the fourth closest star to the solar system, you know, um, after the three that make up the Alpha Centauri system. So this just gives you an idea that if you just did a survey of our local environment, you'd find plenty of red dwarfs among the other stars. In, in, in our little galactic neighborhood. Like all main sequence stars, red dwarfs slowly evolve as they burn up their nuclear fuel, converting hydrogen into helium. Uh, but for red dwarfs, their temperature is small, and this means the fusion rates are really, really slow. So um, a red dwarf, you know, that you would see today will look a lot like a red dwarf you'll see, you know, billions of years from now. A typical red dwarf only meaningfully changes 
and you know in its characteristics over hundreds of billions of years and that's much longer than the age of the universe so really none of them have evolved very much yet okay so they'll just kind of live forever <laughs> so to speak. well you know the universe is probably going to be around longer than that so eventually they'll burn out too but um but mm-hmm. much more slowly than than you know sun like stars or, or more massive stars all right so continuing to move up along our, our you know the main sequence to larger and larger mass stars we get to these sort of stars that are more or less like the sun okay so in addition to being more massive than red dwarfs, these stars are, you know, physically bigger. They have bigger radii, they're hotter, and they're a lot brighter, and they also evolve more quickly. So whereas red dwarfs, like I just said, evolve on time scales typically on the order of hundreds of billions of years, a star with a mass of roughly that of the sun will change, you know, significantly over a period of five to ten billion years. Okay, so our, our sun is about four and a half billion years old. It has a lot more helium in its core now than when it was young, and that's only going to increase. And after another five billion years or so, it's going to basically run out of hydrogen in its core, and that's going to cause a lot of pretty radical changes to set in. Um, Without any hydrogen left in its core to power fusion, that core is going to uh, contract or collapse as the gravity pushes on it and the less fusion pushing out. But this will cause the core to become hotter. And once this happens, it can start to burn not only hydrogen, but helium. And there'll be a ton of helium there. And this is going to like kick in pretty suddenly. It's going to cause uh, a sun-like star to expand really rapidly and, and pretty dramatically. And at this point, it stops being a main sequence star at all. It becomes a completely different kind of star, eventually becoming a thing that we would call a red giant. Red giants, um, although they have a name similar to red dwarfs, are completely different animals. They're truly enormous. They're about a thousand times brighter than the sun. Um, And like when our sun becomes a red giant, it's going to be so big that its radius will like swallow up Mercury and Venus and it's going to totally fry us here on Earth if we're around, you know, five billion years from now. So, like, it's a dramatic and pretty sudden change um, compared to the kind of slow and gradual evolution you see when stars continue along the main sequence. This expansion into the red giant phase, it's relatively sudden for stellar time scales, but it's nowhere near the speed of something like a supernova. It'll still take something like millions of years for the red giants to fully expand, giving those living on Earth some time to react to the changing star, for instance. Once a star leaves the main sequence and starts burning helium, it goes through in kind of rapid succession, at least astrophysically speaking, a bunch of different kind of miniature phases. So there's something called the horizontal branch where stars evolve for a little while. That lasts for about a hundred million years, which sounds like a long time, but by stellar evolution, you know, scales, it's, you know, it's pretty short. It's not billions. It's only millions of years. And then when all that's done, it, it eventually settles down into this red giant phase. And even that, you know, lasts relatively short periods of time compared to the amount of time that that star was, you know, on that steady main sequence lasting for billions of years, um, you know, slowly burning up its hydrogen. And when that red giant phase is over, what's left behind is something pretty different. It's kind of a ball, a dense and compact ball of uh, elements like carbon and oxygen. So when we burnt up all of that helium, it formed things like through the triple alpha process, it it forms carbon. And then that carbon can fuse with other stuff to make oxygen and things like this. And that's the main stuff that's left when this red giant phase is over. People like think of this as kind of a state that might resemble more of like a diamond than any kind of other material we have here on earth. So really dense ball of stuff mostly made of these kind of intermediate mass elements like carbon and oxygen. We call this the star in this phase a white dwarf. And you should think of this as an object that's about as massive as the sun, but squeezed into a volume about the size of the earth. So this is a wildly denser object 
than ordinary stars and wildly more dense than any kind of material you can find on Earth today. So it's like an ultra dense carbon and oxygen nugget in a squeeze into a tiny little ball. So there's no fusion anymore. A white dwarf isn't doing any fusion. The only reason that it doesn't collapse even further is something we call quantum degeneracy pressure. So if you've taken a chemistry class or maybe a quantum physics class, you've probably learned about something called the Pauli exclusion principle. And this basically says that you can't take two fermions, things like, you know, electrons or things like a proton, and you can't put them in the same quantum state. Okay. They all have to be in different states. And in the terms of just trying to pack material into a small enough volume, it means you just can't take things with electrons like white dwarfs that contain a lot of electrons and squeeze them into an arbitrarily small volume. There is There are only so many quantum states to put those electrons in, and that kind of gives you a, a, you know, a size that you can squeeze these things into, and they won't squeeze beyond that as long as they continue to have those electrons. So a white dwarf is supported against the further compression of gravity purely by this quantum degeneracy pressure. So you might think that since there's no fusion going on anymore, a white dwarf would be really cold. Um, but that's actually not true, at least for new white dwarfs. These guys have so much residual energy and so much residual heat from their red giant phase that they can be really, really, really hot on their surfaces, like on, on the ballpark of 100,000 degrees temperature surfaces. This is basically makes them one of the hottest kinds of stars in the universe. But they're so small that even despite their high temperatures, they tend to not be all that bright. So if you look up at the night sky, you don't see white dwarfs very readily, even though they're very, very hot. Um, but with telescopes, you can see quite a few white dwarfs at this point. And then eventually, as white dwarfs radiate their energy, they do steadily cool. And over, you know, billions of years, these white dwarfs will become noticeably colder and eventually cool to things that we, you know, lose their title of white dwarf. They get colder and colder and colder. And in the very, very distant future, our universe will contain a huge plethora of, of stars that we would call black dwarfs, basically cold, inert chunks of things like carbon and oxygen. So I said before that the more massive a star is, the faster it will evolve along the main sequence. So like a sun-like star takes about 10 billion years to end its time on the main sequence and become a red giant and then a white dwarf. A star with a mass that's three times that of the sun will stay in the main sequence for only about uh, 400 million years. So, you know, 50 times or so smaller, shorter than that of the sun. A 10 solar mass star will stay in the main sequence for only about 30 million years. So a pretty short period of time, astrophysically speaking, and so on and so forth. So the bigger you are, the faster you evolve, the faster you burn up your hydrogen. Most of these main sequence stars in the end will become red giants and then white dwarfs. But the really big main sequence stars end up evolving down a, a different trajectory. Stars that are more massive than about eight times the mass of the sun burn through their hydrogen uh, in their core very quickly. This only takes, you know, uh, tens of millions of years or something. And um, and then unlike the smaller st stars, uh, the cores of these massive stars are so hot that they can start burning helium when they run out of hydrogen without ever going through a red giant phase. That they kind of skip the whole horizontal branch and red giant phases that a sun-like star will go through. Instead, they can just start directly fusing helium into carbon through what we call the triple alpha process. And in this phase, the star's atmosphere kind of inflates from all of the uh, the new heat being uh, deposited. And in this stage, they become a star that you'd call a super giant. Super giants can be red, they can be blue, depending on, on their details and their temperature. And then as they burn through this helium in their core, they go on to burn ev other heavier elements. Um, and eventually this results in a core that's made mostly of iron. So along this route, they burn things like neon and sodium and magnesium, oxygen, sulfur, sulfur and so on. 
but ultimately they wind up with the element that has the highest binding energy per nucleon, which is the iron final state. So to put that in another way, the uh, the most energetically preferred state of nuclear matter is iron. And if you can if you can reach iron, you, you know nature doesn't have any reason to keep fusing it into heavier elements. It's kind of, that's where you have extracted the most possible energy out of your nuclei. So once a supergiant's core is mostly made of iron, you know fusion starts to become inefficient, starts to shut off, and then gravity pushes down against that that core, and it causes it to collapse. So when a red giant collapses, quantum degeneracy pressure supports it enough that it squeezes down into a white dwarf, but it stops there. Here you have such a big star and such a massive core that the force of gravity is great enough to overcome this quantum degeneracy pressure, and it you know squeezes things well beyond this uh, white dwarf phase. And the result of this is what we call a supernova, in particular a core collapse supernova, or what we call a type 2 supernova. Before they explode, supergiants typically have masses in the ballpark of 8 to 12 times that of the sun. They have radii that's a lot bigger than the sun, between like 30 and 1,000 times a solar radius. And they're way, way brighter than the sun, you know, between 1,000 and a million times as bright as the sun. And they, are, they have temperatures that can be all over the map. They can be all the way down to the red range at a few thousand degrees, all the way up to the deeply blue or even white range in like tens of thousands, like 40,000 degrees, much hotter than the sun. And a good example is uh, the red supergiant Betelgeuse. So it's only 500 light years away from us. It's the 10th brightest star in the sky. Um, it has a mass, they estimate, somewhere in the range of like 16 to 20 times that of the sun. Its radius is about 760 as times that of the sun. And we expect that Betelgeuse will explode as a supernova sometime in the next 100,000 years or so. Um, which will be a pretty dramatic event, to say the least. What would we see in the sky if we saw Betelgeuse, for example, supernova? Yeah. So when Betelgeuse eventually explodes as a supernova, you know, we should expect to be able to see it with our naked eye in the sky. It, it will be, you know, a really dramatic event. It, it won't be subtle. It will be comparable to some of the historical supernova that have been observed. So like in uh, the year... Uh, 1006, there was a supernova that was observed here on Earth. In 1572, there was a Tycho supernova. In 1604, there was Kepler's supernova. Um, all of these were supernovae that, you know, were big, bright objects in the sky. Nobody missed them. Um, I, you know, and, and they, uh, they, 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 uh, were important in the history of, uh, of astronomy in, in teaching us that, you know, the cosmos wasn't, you know, completely unchanging and static. These were like dramatic changing events out there. Um, and when Betelgeuse one day goes supernova, I think you'll, you'll likely see something pretty similar in the sky. The most recent supernova in the Milky Way is a supernova we call 1987A, and it took place, as you'd guess, in 1987. Um, this is, took place in the LMC, the Large Imaginelic Cloud, which is kind of a satellite galaxy orbiting the Milky Way. Um, and while you couldn't see that one with the naked eye because it's, it's so far away compared to these other ones I've mentioned, it was a boon to astronomers. We uh, you know measured it in a bunch of different ways that had never been measured before, including detecting neutrinos from a supernova for the first time. And there hasn't been a supernova in the Milky Way since 1987. So when these explosions happen, there's like a violent expulsion of the star's outer layers. And this leads to like peak optical luminosities that are comparable to an entire galaxy. So if I look at some distant galaxy with a telescope and a supernova explodes, like the, the whole ga luminosity of that entire galaxy could roughly double because of one star exploding in that, in that galaxy at a time. Um, and that kind of luminosity can persist over weeks or months. So it kind of like, you know, lights up like a Christmas tree and then slowly fades from view over weeks or months. In addition to all that light, 
supernovae produce a huge burst of particles called neutrinos. Typically, something like 10 to the 58 neutrinos are released over a time period of several seconds from a supernova. Um, these neutrinos turn out to carry away almost the entirety of the star's energy, something like 99% of all the gravitational potential of that star gets released in the form of neutrinos. Mm. That kind of seems like a a giant increase in entropy. It just seems yeah. like it's really a, a very fast one. Mm-hmm. And in that way, like a, a true kind of death <laughs> of something in the universe. Yeah, and, and it's not like one of these slow, cool deaths that, uh, you know, small stars have. This is like big. This is going out with a bang. This is a blaze of glory. <laughs> so when a supernova is over, there's going to be something left behind. The core of that star is gonna, isn't going to be blown away um, in that, that stellar wind. Um, but what's left behind depends on exactly how much mass you started with. For stars with masses less than about 25 or so times that of the sun, what's left behind is a neutron star. So we talked about quantum degeneracy pressure before in the context of white dwarfs. And in that case, the electrons in, uh, the, in the, the white dwarf prevented it from being squeezed into smaller volumes. But gravity after a, a supernova is so extreme that um, those electrons and protons kind of destroy each other. They annihilate each other, turning that matter into neutrons. So the gravity then forces all this matter to convert into basically a soup of all neutrons, which can be squeezed into much, much smaller volumes of space. So you can take something that has a mass of more than the sun and you can squeeze it into something that's made entirely of neutrons or almost entirely of neutrons in a volume of about a 10 kilometer radius. So something that the mass of the sun squeezed into something the size of a city. Okay. That's what we're talking about here. Um, extremely, you know, ridiculously absurd densities of matter. That's what a neutron star is. Um, these things don't produce fusion, but they're supported by the, the quantum degeneracy pressure of those neutrons. And um, we don't like directly see neutron stars. So, you know, they, they, they'd be really, really faint and, and, and things like this if you were to look at their surface directly. But what we do see are things we call pulsars, which are powered by neutron stars. So when you take a star, and, and it probably uh, typical stars are rotating on their axis just like the Earth is and just like the Sun is, you know, maybe a, 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 a typical star is orbiting on its axis, not orbiting, but revolving on its axis like once a month or something like this. Um, and then you squeeze it down as it collapses, conserving angular momentum. And when you're done, the thing's spinning something like many times a second. This neutron star spinning many, many times a, spec, uh, a second will produce these beams of light and energy, these, these pulses, right? And then it kind of swings around like a lighthouse, sometimes pointing at our telescope, sometimes not. And this leads to these, this phenomena we call pulsars. And we see these in radio telescopes. We see them in gamma ray telescopes. Um, and, and anytime you see a pulsar, you can be sure that a neutron star is powering it at its core. Some stars that go supernova are so massive that the force of gravity can even overcome the quantum degeneracy pressure associated with a, a neutron star. And in those, they squeeze the neutron star, what would have been a neutron star, into an even smaller volume of space, forming what we call a black hole. So these are stars that started out with more than 25 solar masses, and quantum degeneracy pressure cannot stand up to their gravity. These things get squeezed down to a point where there's so much gravity um, present that the curvature of space and time is so extreme that even things like light can't get out from them. These are completely different and foreign objects to any of the other kinds of stars we've been talking about here. And they're really exotic and they're really incredible. And if you want to know more about black holes, go check out our episode number 20, <laughs> one of the uh, OG episodes. Uh, where we talk about everything there is to talk about, about black holes. <laughs>
Why This Universe is brought to you by the University of Chicago Podcast Network. It's edited and produced by me, Shalma Wegman, and my co-host is Dan Hooper, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and Fermilab. If you like our show and you want to support us even more, you can find us on Patreon. There you can access ad-free episodes of the show, as well as exclusive Ask Us Anything episodes where you get to ask Dan and I direct questions about physics or anything else. So if you are curious about that, you can find it at patreon.com slash why this universe. Thank you so much for listening and for your support.